Uh, this morning we're going to be looking at the mercy of God, and I got a little introduction first before we look at the scriptures, but it's from Joshua 10. Um, there were five Amorite kings that gathered and joined their forces to attack the great city of Gibeon because Gibeon had made peace with Israel. The Canaanite kings were fearful that what happened to Jericho would happen to them, so they thought they would strike first. They laid siege to the city of Gibeon, but messengers from Gibeon were sent to Joshua um, requesting aid. And so Joshua and his warriors, they rode all night from Gilgal to reach Gibeon. And when they arrived, the Lord sent the Amorites uh, into a panic and they began to flee. And we're told that the Lord threw down large stones from heaven and he killed more men with the hailstones than Israel killed with the sword. But there were still many men that got away, and the sun was about to set. So Joshua said in the sight of Israel, Sun, stand still at Gibeon, and the moon in the valley of Ajalon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stopped, until Israel took vengeance on their enemies. The sun stopped in the midst of heaven and did not hurry to set for about a whole day. There has been no day like it before or since when the Lord heeded the voice of a man. No day like this has ever happened before or since the day when the Lord heeded the voice of a man causing the sun to stand still. That is, not until this day when the Son of God stopped and stood still to heed the voice of a blind beggar by the name of Bartimaeus. Let's look at Mark 10, 46 through 52. And they came to Jericho, and, and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, take heart, get up, he's calling you. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus and Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. This is the word of the Lord. All right, let me go ahead and pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, as we come to this text, um, <clears throat> open our eyes. Unclog our ears and work in our hearts in such a way that we would see the reality of your mercy, um, but not just as it applies to Bartimaeus, but as it applies to us. So by your spirit, um, illumine us to the meaning of this incredible text, and we pray that you would do this for our good. And for your glory, in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, um, one of the problems that we have with reading our Bibles is that a lot of times we just simply read it to check it off our to-do list for the day. We read it to get it done so that we feel better about ourselves or in the hopes that God might feel better about us. We don't read it as a means of meeting with God, where we learn more about who He is where we learn more about who we are, where we learn about his ways. Now, most of you, because most I see a lot of gray hairs in here, but for some of you younger ones, you may not remember something that was called snail mail, right? Where we actually hand wrote letters and then put addresses on it and sent it to people, and it would take about three to five days uh, to receive it. Now, Imagine if you were to receive a letter through snail mail from somebody that you cared deeply about. Would you just quickly at a glance 
read it and then dismiss it and go on with your day? Or would you dissect every word? Would you look at every sentence? Would you probably have a dialogue with it which might be the letter of response that you would write? See, you wouldn't just read it once. You'd read it over and over and over again. Well, the Bible is God's love letter to us. When we read our Bibles as a thing to do, or as a way to simply gain more helpful information, the Bible becomes cold, becomes dry, becomes lifeless. It becomes an instruction manual or a self-help book where we look for verses that will give us pearls of wisdom to help us through the day. Or even worse, we may read the Bible like it's an encyclopedia or like a textbook. Then after a while, what happens? We're not as motivated to read it. So days go by where we don't read it. And those days can quickly become weeks, and those weeks can become months. And then people begin to wonder, why does God seem so distant? Why am I so like that third cousin, so unfamiliar with him? And why is he unfamiliar to me? And what I did know about him, golly, that's just like a fading memory right now if the word of god is alive and active if it is sharper than any double-edged sword that pierces to the marrow then god's word is not meant to be read as a textbook that gives you a lot of good information to know for the test no god wants us to enter into his word so that we can better understand and know his heart And this is why I love narratives. Narratives in the Bible, one way to think of a narrative, it's one bucket that God has chosen to carry the waters of the gospel, but in story form. And so when we're in narrative, we don't read narrative the same way we read poetry. We don't read poetry the same way we read apocalyptic literature and we don't read apocalyptic literature the same way we read wisdom right so a narrative is a story it's one that we're meant to enter into we're meant to taste see touch hear what's going on so we experience the reality of this text narratives are meant for us to put ourselves in the scene So this is why this passage that we're going to look at, it isn't to give us information about God's mercy and then, oh, we study it and now how do we apply it to our lives? No, it's meant to reach our hearts. It's meant to land in our lives in such a way that it actually changes us. It actually transforms us. It actually causes us to want to be and to follow Jesus. So notice how it all starts in verse 46. It starts with the place. Where are we? Jericho. One commentator said this, the road from Jericho to Jerusalem, it passed through desolate mountainous country, and I've been on it, that was notorious for being unsafe. This is the place where Jesus tells the story about the Good Samaritan. We all know the Old Testament place of Jericho, right? It was the place where the walls fell down when Joshua. But it means more than that because Jericho symbolized a city that stood in the way of God. It stood in the way of God's people taking possession of the promised land. So it's a self-reliant city that stood in the way of God. And this is the place that Jesus chose to stop before his final ascent to Jerusalem. So we have the place, Jericho, and a dangerous road leading up to Jerusalem. But we also have the setting in verse 46. Who's there? There's a great crowd traveling from Jericho to Jerusalem. Now this crowd, it's not following Jesus. This crowd is on their way to pilgrimage for the Feast of Tabernacles and the Passover that are approaching. 
And it was the custom that the pilgrims would recite what is known as the Psalms of Ascent, which is Psalm 120 to Psalm 134. They would recite these Psalms on the way. So as the feasts are approaching, this journey, it's filled with prayers. It's filled with God's Word being recited and sung. So this must have been a pretty spiritual caravan on its way to Jerusalem, right? But then immediately, we're introduced to a person. Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, who was sitting by the roadside. So we have the place, we have a setting, we have a person, but it's with this person that we find our entry into this scene. See, what do we see about him? What do we know about him? What do we hear about Bartimaeus? We know his name. Do you realize that this is the first person that Jesus heals in the Gospels where we know his name? I mean, he's healed many people, right? But we don't know their names. But we know Bartimaeus, which means this is pretty significant. So what else do we know? He's a blind beggar. We don't know how long he's been blind. We don't know what caused it. But what we do know is this man cannot see. His life is lived in complete darkness. He's dependent on the help of others to go anywhere, to lead him anywhere. He can't function as a normal human being. He can't hold a job, which means he has no source of income. means he can't provide for a family if he even has one. He has to beg for money. So he's an outcast. He's a social problem. (laughs) He's someone who people, if we're honest, shy away to avoid when they see him. He can't take care of himself and he has to rely on the generosity of others. In other words, Bartimaeus is a man who has no dignity in the eyes of others. And notice where he is. Look at the text closely. Notice where he is. He's by the roadside. He's not on it. He's by it. He's pushed off to the side in a ditch. So he's not in the game of life. He's sitting on the sidelines while normal people walk by living out their normal lives. All these spiritual people People on pilgrimage to Jerusalem for the feasts are passing him by. Now, we don't know if some stop to give him alms or not. But what we do know is that the majority are ignoring him as they pass him by. And then we learn something else about him that Mark wants us to know. He's the son of Timaeus. Blind Bartimaeus is somebody's son. He's somebody's child. He's a human being with the hopes and dreams that have been dashed. In other words, blind Bartimaeus is a person. He's not a problem. He's the least of the least. He's cast aside by society. He's broken, and he's unfit to function in normal, everyday life. And then in verse 47, Mark wants us to know the most important thing about him. He is so broken, he is so desperate, that he cries out for mercy. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Now look at how the crowds respond to him in verse verse 48. Many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. In other words, the crowds are rebuking him, telling him to shut up. They're shaming him into silence. So can you see or imagine 
how insignificant Bartimaeus feels. He can't see their faces, but he feels how they view him. He hears how they view him in their rebuke and tone. You're worthless. You're insignificant. You're a nuisance, Bartimaeus. You're an inconvenience. Nobody wants to hear what you want to say, so shut your mouth and be silent. Man, when you're cast off, when you feel the indignity of being treated as less than human, shamed to shut up because you're an inconvenience and a problem to everybody else, when your hopes and dreams are crushed, And shame upon shame is being heaped at you. What do you do? Well, you can either try to suck it up and press on for one more day. Or you just give up on life and you end it all because what's the point? Or in your brokenness and in your desperation, you cry out For mercy. But notice, the more the crowd tried to silence him, the more he cries out, Son of David, have mercy on me. And then the most amazing thing happens in verse 49. We're told Jesus stopped. But in the Greek, he literally says, Jesus stood still. The Son of God, with a heavy heart, on his way to Jerusalem, knowing that he was about to drink the cup of God's wrath, knowing he's about to be separated from his Father for the first time from all eternity, with a heavy heart, knowing he's going to be betrayed knowing he's going to be deserted by all of his disciples, knowing he's going to be rejected by the religious leaders, knowing he's going to be condemned by Pilate, knowing this, he heeded a man's voice and stopped and stood still. The Son of God stood still because a desperate man cried out for mercy. Can you hear the deafening silence when Jesus stopped? Can you feel the force of those words? Jesus stood still. See, Jesus stops for mercy. Jesus stops for brokenness. Jesus stops for desperation. Jesus stops for suffering. He stops for the shamed. He stops for the least of the least, for the outcast. The Son of God stood still for a blind beggar crying out for one thing and one thing only mercy see the irony of this story is that blind Bartimaeus is the only one who truly sees where everybody else is still blind see blind Bartimaeus sees Jesus more clearly than even his disciples do look at Bartimaeus' understanding of who Jesus is. I mean, he obviously has some understanding of Jesus, right? Because when he hears that Jesus is walking on the road, he calls out to him, Jesus, son of David. Jesus is on his way to the city that David made his capital, which is centrally located in order to unite all of Israel. 
the city where God firmly established David's rule over Israel. The city where God promised David in 2 Samuel 7 that he would raise up a king after him who would be an everlasting king, who would establish an everlasting kingdom. The seed of David would be this king. And ever since God's promise to David in 2 Samuel 7, Israel has been waiting for that king. Israel has been hoping for that king. Israel has been longing for that king. And in extra biblical writings during this time, it was believed that the Messiah would be a warrior king like David. Quote, someone who will punish and defeat all sinners. Bartimaeus sees Jesus as that king. He is the one who will usher in God's eternal kingdom. But notice, Bartimaeus doesn't believe that this king is here to punish sinners. No, Bartimaeus believes that the son of David is here to be merciful to sinners. Bartimaeus believes that the kingdom of God is established by God, con- by God's conquering king who would conquer, not through his power, but through his grace and through his mercy. The son of David will conquer, not by crushing and condemning sinners, but by forgiving and pardoning sinners, by standing with And four sinners who have no hope save for the king's mercy. Son of David, have mercy on me. When Jesus heeded the voice of Bartimaeus and stopped, everything in this scene changes. Notice the crowd that was rebuking Bartimaeus to shame him into silence is now saying to him in verse 49, Take heart! Get up! He's calling you! And then notice Bartimaeus' excitement. He throws off his cloak. He springs up as fast as he can, and he finds his way to Jesus. And then notice what Jesus asks him. What do you want me to do For you. In other words, (laughs) Jesus is giving Bartimaeus a blank check to spend it on whatever he wants to spend it on. He is giving the opportunity to ask whatever he wants. And all he wants to be able to do is to function as a normal human being. One commentator said this, In humble trust, Bartimaeus asks not for wealth, power, or success, but only for sight. He asks not to be superhuman, but simply human. He just wants to become whole again. He just wants to recover his sight and be a normal human being again. Now notice, Bartimaeus' humble request is not on the basis of his worthiness. And it's not on the basis of his strength. It's in the context of his desperation and weakness. You see, the crowd was right in their assessment. Bartimaeus can't contribute anything to Jesus. But they were wrong in thinking that his weakness and his brokenness disqualifies him from mercy. Jesus stopped for a man who saw his desperate need for God's mercy. A man who trusted in Jesus to do for him what he cannot do for himself. 
In other words, Jesus' power is exerted in Bartimaeus' weakness. Now look at verse 52. And Jesus said to him, go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. The word for made well here, it means healed and saved. Your faith has saved you. Your faith has healed you. Your faith in me has made you whole again. Bartimaeus, in other words, has been healed physically and spiritually. His sight is immediately restored, but so is his heart. He's no longer on the side of the road. (laughs) He's now on the road. He's no longer on the sidelines of life, but he's on the road of following Jesus. In other words, he's back in the game of life. He's functioning as a normal human being because Jesus in his mercy has made him whole. So what do we learn from this story? True faith, it's trusting and receiving what Jesus does for us. It's not trusting in in anything you do. True faith, in other words, knows that you have nothing to offer. You have nothing to contribute to your salvation. True faith is knowing you're the least of the least. It's knowing you're helpless and blind. It's when you come to the end of yourself and all you can do is beg for mercy and trust in the one who's filled with mercy. Blind Bartimaeus sees his desperate need for God's mercy more clearly than anyone else That's why we know his name. We know his name because he's a model of true faith. God has made the least of the least great. And now what's Bartimaeus doing? He's following Jesus. On the way. On the way where? To the cross. But here it is, don't miss this, because this is where a lot of, again, teachers uh, mess it up. Because we immediately take the text and go to us. We say, now be like Bartimaeus. Go out and be like Bartimaeus. That's not the application of this text. No, the application for us is found in Jesus' question to Bartimaeus. What do you want me to do for you? Do you want Jesus to grant you power and fame? Do you want wealth and success? Do you want greatness and influence? You want other people to acknowledge you, to think highly of you, to be attracted to you? Do you want Jesus to give you whatever you want because you think getting what you want is what will make you happy? Do you want Jesus, in other words, to be your genie in a bottle? Or do you want him to be your merciful Savior? where He would be merciful and gracious towards you in your selfishness. Where He would forgive you for your sins. Where He would pardon you. 
where He would restore you and make you whole again. In other words, do you want Jesus to justify and embrace you, to accept you with His love? Do you want Jesus to live a perfect, sinless life for you? So He can give you His righteousness, which you don't have and so desperately need. Do you want Jesus to sacrificially serve you by going to the cross to pay the penalty for all of your sin? Do you want Jesus to free you from yourself? To free you to get back in the life and be a normal human being who loves and serves others rather than trying to be more than human. What do you want Jesus to do for you? Faith in Jesus and what He does for you is the only thing that can save you that can restore you, that can make you whole. See, a lot of us remain blind and we don't cry out for mercy because we really don't see that we're not trusting in Jesus. We're trusting in something else. We're looking for life. We're looking for satisfaction. We're looking for meaning. We're looking for wholeness in something other than Jesus. Thinking that, man, if I get this, then I'll be happy. Then I'll be whole. Then I'll be successful in my job. Then I'll make a lot of money. Then I can rise to positions of power and then other people are going to think highly of me. Bartimaeus is the model of faith. Why? Because he knew he deserved nothing. And he cried out to Jesus for the only thing he knows he needs. Jesus, Son of David, be merciful to me. Stories told uh, of a mother who approached Napoleon seeking a pardon for her son. The emperor replied that the young man had committed a certain offense twice and justice demanded death. But I don't ask for justice, the mother explained. I plead for mercy. But your son does not deserve mercy, Napoleon said. Sir, the woman cried, it would not be mercy if he deserved it. And mercy is all I ask for. Well then, the emperor said, I will have mercy. And spared the woman's son. You see, you should want to follow Jesus. Because he stops and he stands still for cries of mercy. So cry out to him for mercy. Cry out to Him in your brokenness and in your weakness. Cry out to Him in your suffering and in your selfishness. Confess your sin to Him. Confess you're still blind. You still try to find wholeness from false saviors. So repent and return to the real Savior. Richard Sibbs um, famous Puritan, he wrote a book called The Bruised Reed. And he says this, this is a statement that, again, I wish I could make you believe this was true, but I can't. So I could tell you the statement, spend the rest of the day thinking about this statement. He says this, there is more mercy to be found in Jesus 
then there is sin in you. So cry out for mercy and watch the Son of God heed your voice and stand still for you. Let me pray. Our gracious and merciful Heavenly Father. Again, it's not be like Bartimaeus. It's what do we want you to do for us? Help us to cry out for mercy. In our desperation, in our brokenness, in our shame, in our selfishness, we can cry out for mercy. And this word tells us that you hear it, that you stop, and that you stand still for cries of mercy. So, oh God, be merciful to us. Give us and do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. Help us to see ourselves rightly so that we see you rightly. And I pray that when we do, you would change and transform us in such a way that we become merciful and grant mercy to others. And we ask of this in Jesus' name. Amen.